Um, dear guests, my name is Maurice Pomerantz. I'm the senior director of the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute and an associate professor of literature and Arab cross crossroads studies here at NYU AD. And tonight it is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you the final in a series of lectures on the environment and the Middle East, organized by the Arab Crossroads Studies Program here at NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, this is, if you don't know Arab Crossroads, it's an undergraduate studies program focused on the UAE and its place in the broader region. Uh, and this program is, I think, exemplary uh, because it focuses on the region um, from a variety of different disciplinary research perspectives. The current lecture is the third in a series on the environment in the Middle East organized by the program, uh, which has included talks on climate change and its local impact in Lebanon, the history and historiography of the plague in the early modern Middle East, and the biopolitics of waste in Palestine. Our speaker today, uh, Faisal Hussein is an environmental historian focusing on the Middle East region with a primary interest in, of course, water as a resource, as a mode of transportation, and in fact, even a tool of governance. Um, he's examined the role of the Tigris and the Euphrates in the establishment of Ottoman state institutions in the eastern frontier between the 16th and the 18th centuries um, in a book uh, entitled the, uh, the Rivers of the Sultans, is that correct? Yes. Um, the book won the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association's Book Prize and was a finalist for the American Society for Environmental History's George Perkins Marsh Prize. I had the opportunity today to listen to Dr. Hussein speak of his education. He began his undergraduate career as a business student, but was fascinated with historical topics in his general education courses at Penn State. And he entered his graduate studies in 2012 at Yale, um, which was in many, many ways a very fortuitous moment in his career um, because uh, at that point he met, um, not only was it a, a momentous year for the environmental history of the Middle East uh, with two um, path-breaking books published in that, uh, field by Alain Mikhail and Sam White, and um, Dr. Hussein was lucky to actually meet uh, and study with Alain Mikhail, who became an advisor of him. He's no stranger to NYU Abu Dhabi as well. Um, and this, I think, started him off in this trajectory. Dr. Hussein then wrote a dissertation at Georgetown University with the well-known global historian John McNeil, uh, which he completed in 2018. He describes himself as an environmental historian of the Ottoman Empire with a geographical focus on the eastern provinces in Anatolia and Iraq. Um, tonight, Dr. Hussein will be talking about his broader project in a lecture entitled The Tigris and Euphrates in the Ottoman Period. So um, please, everyone, uh, join me in welcoming him here tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Maurice, for the kind introduction. Um, it is, uh, let me start by thanking NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, uh, Professor Maurice Pomeranz, Nahid Ahmed, and Amna Zahiri for organizing this event um, and hosting me in this wonderful multilingual and multicultural campus. It is an honor to be here, and I spoke to a couple of members of the audience before I got started. And I was deeply moved to realize that many in the audience right now today are not even academics. They come from the general public who do other things for a living, but they just, uh, they're devoting a couple of hours from their time at night on Wednesday just out of personal curiosity. And this is such a wonderful thing. And unfortunately, it's not common everywhere in the world. So thank you so much for showing up um, I really appreciate it. So today I would like to talk about my book, which is A History of the Tigris and Euphrates Rivers in the Ottoman Empire uh, during the Ottoman period. Um, so not long time ago, I was a PhD student 
And I went to the Ottoman archives with a very basic question. And that question was, what role, if any, did the Tigris and Euphrates play in the history of the Ottoman Empire? And this question was born out of uh, frustration. I was frustrated why historical surveys of the ancient Near East and ancient Mesopotamia, they tend to start with a chapter devoted to the centrality and the significance of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. How central those rivers were to the rise of the first states in the region and how central they were to the rise of the first civilizations in the world. At the same time, when I opened books of history, modern surveys of the modern Middle East, I saw very little mention of the Tigris and Euphrates. And I wondered what happened to the Tigris and Euphrates in the post-classical period, after the Mongol conquest. Why do they feature so prominently in historical surveys of the ancient Near East, but they virtually disappear in our historiographical treatments of the modern Middle East after the Mongol conquest. So I, I, I want to answer that question. What role did the Tigris and Euphrates play, if any, in the political history of the region? And I found the Ottoman period was the best period to answer that question. And the reason is because the Ottoman state maintained a really impressive archival record for historians to explore today. And the saying, what my uh, former uh, advisor told me, Alan Mikhail, um, the Ottoman state sailed on a, on a sea of paper. The archival record is simply stunning. And not only that, that the fact that Ottoman archival records exist in large number, they are also, they happen to be highly accessible. The process of registering in the Ottoman archive is really straightforward and easy and makes it um, really a comfortable process uh, to, uh, to conduct research on any topic of Ottoman history. And this is not common, especially if you talk to historians working on other parts of the world. Just before this talk, I had a wonderful conversation with Masha, uh, Maurice's partner, and she described her struggles to secure access to, to the archives of the former territories of the Soviet Union. It's a long and difficult process. Luckily, uh, this is not the case for those interested in the Ottoman Empire. So this is why I chose to answer my question by focusing on the Ottoman period in particular. Now, after I went to the archive, I was not sure if I would find anything relevant that would allow me to answer my question. Is there anything in the archive that tells me about the role of the Tigris and Euphrates in Ottoman history? I, would, I did not know, like anyone just starting their archive of research. Luckily, I was proven wrong. I found so much in the Ottoman archive dealing with all different aspects of the history of the Tigris and Euphrates that I ended up having to limit the scope of my research. And I ended limiting the scope of my research to the time period that we normally call the early modern period, roughly the centuries between the 1500s to the late 1700s. Okay? So today I would like to share the results of my research and to share the answers I was able to come up with and that will be in the form of six points. So I would like to start by describing the geography of my story, the timeline of my story, then the argument. I will then present a case study. I will test the argument. And then I will conclude with a historiographical discussion. And my goal from, instead of just giving you my answer right away to my research question is I will lay uh, the groundwork, for, especially for those with no background in the geography and the historiography of the region. All right, so without further ado, let me start with the first item on my agenda with geography, to give you a sense of place in, in the hope that it will be easier for you to follow the story. So this map gives a holistic view of where 
the Tigris and Euphrates are located. So the Tigris River is here and flows to the east, and the Euphrates flows to the west. From a purely geographical uh, definition, we can describe the Tigris and Euphrates basically as the great natural drainage system of West Asia. This is why the Tigris and Euphrates exist. Their basic function is to drain uh, surplus rainfall and snow melt from the Taurus and the Zagros Mountains in the north all the way down to the south in the Gulf. And in the process, the Tigris and Euphrates pass through Anatolia, Syria, and Iraq, and they become entangled in, histories, in their histories, sometimes in very unexpected ways. Now, in popular culture, we normally refer to the Tigris and Euphrates as twin rivers. And there are many good reasons why we can describe the Tigris and Euphrates as twin rivers. I will mention only three reasons why this is an apt definition and description of the Tigris and Euphrates. So one reason the Tigris and Euphrates are called twin rivers is because like other twins, the Tigris and Euphrates emerge from the same womb. And in this case, the Tigris and Euphrates emerge from the same geological womb. And that geological womb is the Taurus mountain system in what is now southeastern Turkey. So both the Tigris and Euphrates emerge from this mountainous womb. They flow until they drain in the south into the Gulf. Another reason why the Tigris and Euphrates are called twin rivers is because, like other twins, the Tigris and Euphrates also share a birth date. In geological history, the Tigris and Euphrates were born roughly around the same time, sometime between 35 and 20 million years ago. Lastly, the Tigris and Euphrates are normally called twin rivers simply because, like all twins, the, the Tigris and Euphrates look and behave in very similar ways. Both of them flood in the spring months, and both of them sink low in the summer and early fall. Now, like all twins we're fortunate to know in our family and social circles, the Tigris and Euphrates have their differences that make each one of them unique in its own way. Still, the shared genealogy and the shared birth date and the shared habits of the Tigris and Euphrates give us enough justification to call them twin rivers, despite their several differences. Before I move away from this map, I want to make sure that we're all paying attention to one deep pattern in the history of the river valley, because this pattern is very important to the story that I'm going to tell. And this pattern is that from ancient times until in the 19th century and the introduction of steam navigation, the Tigris and Euphrates were navigable only downstream from the north to the south, all right? So, for example, the Euphrates River, for most of history until the 19th century, could be navigated virtually in its entirety from the town of Birajik in southeastern Turkey down to the south and the Gulf. Likewise, the Tigris River was also virtually navigable in its entirety only downstream. That's from the city of Diyarbakir in southeastern Turkey down to the Gulf in the south. On the other hand, upstream navigation from south to the north in the other direction was always very difficult and it was confined within a small geography. So let me give you a sense of the geographical extent of upstream navigation compared to the extent of downstream navigation. So for example, ships navigating the Euphrates could only travel so far as the town of Hella in southern Iraq. Further north of this point, the Euphrates could not be navigated before the uh, the introduction of steam technology in the 19th century. Likewise, 
the Tigris River was only navigable up to the city of Baghdad. Beyond north of Baghdad, the Tigris was virtually impossible to navigate before the introduction of steam technology. And even within this limited geography of upstream navigation, upstream navigation was always very difficult and very time consuming and so costly that it became virtually irrelevant and marginal to the large scheme of things up to the 19th century. And this has a lot to do with environmental factors. So as ships try to navigate deep into the interior of West Asia, ships had to deal with river rapids and northerly winds that made, made upstream navigation beyond this line, north of Hella and north of Baghdad, virtually impossible. So that's all I wanted to make sure that we know about the geographical setting of my story, where the Tigris and Euphrates are located, how they, uh, they're similar and different, and also the deep pattern that I just explained. For most of history, the Tigris and Euphrates were only navigable downstream. Upstream navigation was a marginal uh, uh, function for the Twin Rivers. Now, with this geographical background in mind, I feel ready to talk about the second item on my agenda, which is the timeline. So, the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, for most of history, was politically fragmented. The normal state of affairs in the river valley was different portions of the river system were controlled by different states competing with each other. And in fact, the earliest evidence we have of conflict over water resources come from this region. Two different Mesopotamian city-states fighting against each other. This is where the earliest written record of conflict over water comes from. Comes from the third millennium BCE uh, among the Sumerian city-states. This was the normal state of affairs in the region, that the rivers were rarely united under one political authority. This state of affairs of political fragmentation finally came to an end in the early 16th century of the Common Era. So what happened in the early 16th century? Well, we have an aggressive expansionist campaign by the Ottoman state into the Middle East. The Ottoman state used to be confined, confining its military conquests into the Balkans and Western Anatolia. But now suddenly the Ottoman state, especially under the leadership of Selim I and Suleiman I, uh, decided to turn their gaze uh, eastward and decided to expand their territories into, um, in, into the Middle East. And the unintended consequence of those military conquests, that was something very unusual was that for the, for the first time in many centuries, now we see the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley unified under one imperial roof, and that was a government based in the city of Istanbul, the, the base of the Ottoman state and the Ottoman government. And this map shows boundaries of the Ottoman state in the middle of the 16th century. And if you notice, I tried to make sure that the largest river system of the Ottoman Empire are visible on the map. And you see, so if we compare the Tigris and Euphrates compared to the Danube uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, and with the Nile in Northern and Eastern Africa, it was only the Tigris and Euphrates river system that was brought in its entirety within the boundaries of the Ottoman state. The Nile, for most of Ottoman history, was controlled by the Ottoman state only within its Egyptian portion. And the same case with the Danube. Ottoman control of the Danube did not go beyond Budapest in Hungary. And this is what makes the history, um, the 16th century, a very unusual vase in the history of river systems um, in the region. And that's why I begin my story in the early 16th century. Uh, because now, from the early 16th century, you see a central administration that begins to coordinate uh, with upstream settlements and downstream settlements the exploitation 
and the usage and utilizing the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in a way that is really unprecedented by the deep history, deep political history of the region. And in particular, the Ottoman government was really obsessed with coordinating how the Tigris and Euphrates were controlled for navigation. For the Ottoman state, this was the top priority, way more important than irrigation, agriculture, and other purposes. For the Ottoman state, it was obsessed with coordinating how the twin rivers were used for navigational purposes. And I will explain shortly why this was the case. So this is the starting point of my story. In the early 16th century, and I explained why I start in this time. Now, the end point of my story is in the late 18th century, around the year 1780. And I end here because I argue by then, around the year 1780, the late 18th century, the centralized Ottoman system of river management would disintegrate due to a combination of political and environmental disasters, as well as due to the rise of the Russian threat from the north. And this deadly cocktail of disasters and the rise of a new rival from the north that used to be a subservient to the Ottoman government. Russia, in the 16th century, looked up to the Ottoman state. But the tables were finally turned in the 18th century and decisively by the late 18th century. And all this, these, uh, the confluence of these factors really turned the, the, the concerns of the Ottoman government to the northern and the western front to the detriment of uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. After 1780, the, the Tigris and Euphrates would remain under Ottoman control, but the Ottoman government would delegate their management mostly to the provinces of the region. Um, so the history of the Tigris and Euphrates after 1780 is so different um, that it deserves another uh, separate study that looks, in, looks into it. Now, before I move on, um, I want to make sure that we all pay attention um, to, um, to one thing from this map, which is that the Tigris and Euphrates um, flowed within the, along the eastern borderland of the Ottoman Empire. And that is really important to keep in mind. So what do I mean by that? So this is where the Tigris and Euphrates are located. And if you pay attention, the eastern borderland is right next to the river system. And on the other side of the border was the Safavid Empire based in Iran. And for those uh, who don't know, the Safavid Empire in Iran was the Ottoman Empire's major nemesis in the east. And the fact that the Tigris and Euphrates happened to flow along the eastern borderland of the Ottoman Empire, um, the borderland with Safavid Iran, was very important because it really shaped and changed the way that the Ottoman state looked at the river system. And Always, whenever they decided how the rivers would be managed and utilized, Ottoman decision makers always had this in mind. How do we deal with the Safavid threat in the east? And how we can rely on the Tigris and Euphrates to deal with this menace? Okay, so this is the second item on my agenda I wanted to make clear, which is the timeline. And I, to summarize my timeline, the story I'm going to tell is about the rise of a centralized Ottoman system of river management in the 16th century, which would become localized or provincialized over the course of the 18th century, and it would become mostly the decisions would be, uh, uh, the shots would be called from the provinces rather than the central government in Istanbul. Now we're done with the geography timeline. I feel I'm ready in a good uh, position to flesh out the argument of my project. So, so I argue in the book that the Ottoman unification of the Tigris and Euphrates mattered a great deal for most of the 16th and 17th centuries, 
primarily because the Tigris and Euphrates helped solve a chronic ecological imbalance along the Ottoman eastern borderland with the Safavid Empire. So what is the ecological imbalance that prevailed in this eastern borderland that the Ottoman Empire had to deal with? And how did the river system enable Istanbul to deal and solve this ecological imbalance? So let me explain first this, what I mean by a chronic ecological imbalance on the eastern frontier, and then I will describe how the Tigris and Euphrates helped the Ottoman state to solve it, and why it was so important for the Ottoman state to solve it, because there could be ecological imbalances around the world, but they may not matter much. But I will explain why it was very important for the Ottoman state to deal with this ecological imbalance in this part of the world, and how the Tigris and Euphrates were central to how the Ottomans sought to deal with it. Okay, so what about the ecological imbalance on the eastern frontier? So if you pay attention to this map, this is a map of annual rainfall average in the region. So in the, between the cities of Mosul and Baghdad, the latitude 35 degrees uh, uh, north runs. So this is the line, the dotted red line that you see here on the map. This is a very important uh, line we normally ignore uh, in our studies of the region. It's very important. And the reason is that north of this line, precipitation in the region is really high, comparatively, and also transpiration from the soil and evap evaporation from the soil and transpiration from plants are very low. Those are, this, I'm, I'm using scientific jargon, but though what the net result of those conditions high precipitation and low evaporation and transpiration really meant that Ottoman provinces that happened to be based north of this line, they enjoyed a moist climate that was supportive of forest growth and rain-fed agriculture, all right? So any community that was based north of this line, generally speaking, it enjoyed a moist climate. It was moist enough to enable forest growth. So for societies that were based north of this line, they enjoyed a good um, amount of forest, forest resources that they could obtain within their locality. They did not have to seek forest resources and import them from elsewhere. Thanks to the large average of rainfall that the, re the region receives to enable those forests to emerge and flourish. And also a moist climate meant that the irrigation, the, the farming system north of this line was very distinct and that it was based on rain-fed agriculture. So farmers could practice and continue their agricultural way of life, counting entirely on rainfall. Irrigation agriculture, as it prevailed in Egypt and the Tigris and Euphrates, was irrelevant. Why would those societies based north of this line bother with building um, a sophisticated and costly irrigation system, knowing that they had a free and easy source of water at their disposal in the form of rainfall. So this was the happy situation in the north. It was a land of plenty, a land of plenty when it comes to forest resources, a land of plenty in terms of uh, rainfall. The situation south of this line could not be more depressing and different than the situation in the north. So here, once we cross this threshold, you get into, deep into the arid core of the Middle East, where the climate was arid enough to thin out the vegetation cover. So south of this line, it was very difficult. Uh, forest resources were very limited compared to the forest resources of the north because there was simply not enough precipitation to allow for forest growth uh, to take place south of this line. Also, the aridity had a, another important role, is that rain-fed agriculture was nearly impossible south of this line. Farmers, if they wanted to live south of this line, that was their call, but they had to come up with an alternative system uh, to the system of rain-fed agriculture, 
that prevailed in the north. And that was tended to be irrigation agriculture. And this is why we find irrigation agriculture thrived south of this line, especially in Egypt and Iraq, not because farmers happened to have unusual affection to both river system, is because they had no other option. And this was the only viable uh, source of water, the Tigris and Euphrates and the Nile, to maintain a sustained and durable, settled and agricultural existence. Otherwise, a settled and agricultural life was very difficult to sustain over the long term. Okay, so this is one component of the ecological imbalance that the Ottoman state had to deal with. It had uh, the eastern frontier, the, the environmental situation was very different. And the, in the upstream regions, their provinces had ample forest resources and they had ample rainfall to practice rain-fed agriculture. But south of this line, in the eastern frontier, the situation was very different. There were very little forest resources that they could obtain locally. So all forest resources had to be imported from elsewhere. And also rainfall was meager and did not allow for rain-fed agriculture. Now, there is another component to the ecological imbalance that I described. And this component had less to do with the 35 degrees line and more to do with the natural distribution of ore deposits. So ore deposits, which were necessary for societies to obtain useful metals and to produce all those products where, that were necessary to sustain an advanced culture compared to societies around them. So due to ge geological accident in Asia, ore deposits in Asia happen to be abundant north of the 35 degrees line. On the other hand, ore deposits happen to be in shortage south of this line. And this further widened the mineral wealth gap between the two zones, the northern upstream zone and the southern uh, downstream zone. Okay, so to summarize the problem that I just outlined, the Ottoman state, since its expansion into this part of the world in the early 16th century, had to grapple with a chronic ecological imbalance along the eastern frontier. So the upstream region had abundant ore deposits, abundant forests, and abundant rainfall, while the downstream region was plagued by the scarcity of all those things. There was a chronic shortage of rainfall, there was a chronic shortage of uh, timber, and there was a chronic uh, 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 short shortage of metals. Now, what does that have to do, this ecological imbalance, have to do with the Tigris and Euphrates? Well, I argue that the Ottoman Empire, between the 16th and especially the 17th centuries, used the Tigris and Euphrates primarily to solve this ecological imbalance. How? By organizing regular shipments of grain, metal, and timber from upstream areas of surplus in the north and to channel them to downstream areas of shortage in the south. All right, so now let me just talk in more detail about those regular shipments that the Ottoman state organized and coordinated along the eastern frontier to even out the disparity in natural resources along the eastern frontier from areas of surplus in the north to areas of shortage in the south, right? So the Tigris and Euphrates allowed the Ottoman state to redistribute grain from Anatolia in the north to Iraq in the south. And the state delivered grain to the south, mostly in the form of wheat and barley. Now, why would the Ottoman state, based in Istanbul, about a thousand miles away, bother with the redistribution of this very basic commodity along the eastern frontier? As I said, there are ecological imbalances around the world. But why did the Ottoman state pay particular attention to the disparity in how the availability of grains from north to south in this part of the world? Well, the Ottoman state cared deeply about uh, balancing out those natural resources because the Ottoman state needed to maintain a sizable military presence south of, of the river basin. And that is because, as I said, this is uh, a high-risk political environment 
in, the early, in early modern times. It was along the eastern frontier. And here the Ottoman state had to deal with rivals. A rival based in Iran, mostly the Safavid Empire, a rival that was based in the Gulf, that for most of the 16th century was the Portuguese Empire, and rivals in the, based in the deserts of Arabia and Syria that were, did not do Ottoman bedding all the time, and they were very combative with Ottoman authorities. And to deal with those many rivals in this distant part of the Ottoman state, the Ottoman state had to, deal, to maintain a large and feed a large uh, military presence in the region. And this is why the Ottoman state cared deeply about uh, balancing out grain resources to make sure its large military presence had enough grain to feed its troops. And a large portion of the Ottoman archival record really deals with those regular shipments. How much of it was dist uh, distributed, in what year, and how many troops were able to be fed, and how each soldier, how, uh, what amount of wheat and barley they needed to be st stationed in this part of the eastern frontier for a year. All right? So this is one basic commodity that the Ottoman state was able to balance out, counting on uh, the role of the Tigris and Euphrates for uh, river transportation. Aside from grain, the Tigris and Euphrates allowed the Ottoman state to redistribute metals from the north to the, to the south, and metal was delivered by the Ottoman state mostly in the form of um, armaments, be it artillery, firearms, or ammunition. And this was another uh, 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 commodity that the Ottoman state wanted to uh, even out along the eastern frontier because the Ottoman state did not only want to keep uh, a large and sizable military presence that was well fed, but also this sizable military presence had to be equipped with the latest and most advanced weapons available at the time to maintain the Ottoman military edge in this vulnerable frontier region of the Ottoman Empire. Lastly, aside from grain and arms, the Tigris and Euphrates allowed the Ottoman state to redistribute timber from north to south, and timber came in the form mostly of ships and boats. And this was another important uh, natural resource that the Ottoman state wanted to make sure that there is enough of it south of the river valley for two main reasons. The Ottoman state wanted to maintain a good navy in this, uh, along the eastern frontier to protect its political interests um, in this sensitive zone. But also, those ships and boats were necessary to make sure that those grains, those arms, and more men would const constantly be dispatched to the south southern portion of the eastern frontier and to continue to maintain and cement the Ottoman presence in this challenging part of the Ottoman state. Okay? So let me state, restate my argument. So for most of the 16th and 17th centuries, this imperial system of waterborne communication that I just outlined, um, built around unified river channels, solved the ecological imbalance between the upstream and downstream provinces, and eventually anchored the Ottoman presence in the eastern frontier, and in a way that was very difficult to accomplish without the aid of river transportation, and the fact that the Tigris and Euphrates were unified under one political authority. Okay, so by now I am done with three items of my agenda. In my agenda, I described the geography uh, of my story, the timeline, and the argument. Now I want to talk very briefly about a case study. So, so far, my argument was very general. I want to be more specific how the Ottoman system of river transportation impacted one specific locality and back up those changes, my explanation of those changes with some numbers, okay? So just to get a sense of how important river transportation was to the Ottoman presence in the East, okay? So the locality that I'm going to choose to fully, to better understand the significance of Ottoman river transportation in the 16th, between the 16th and 18th centuries is Baghdad. Uh, 
and Baghdad is the site where we can see the full consequences of Ottoman river transportation on the Tigris and Euphrates. And I chose Baghdad because Baghdad was the biggest beneficiary of Ottoman river transportation. Why was Baghdad better advantaged and better positioned to enjoy the advantages of Ottoman river transportation than other settlements? There are two reasons that made Baghdad well positioned than other places to enjoy the advantages of river transportation. So one uh, reason is that Baghdad was highly accessible by ships coming from the north and the upstream or coming from downstream. If you remember, Baghdad is one of a few cities, sizable cities, that could be approached by river transportation, whether they were heading from the north or the south. All right, and this was not the case for most Ottoman settlements in the region. Another reason was why Baghdad was better positioned to enjoy the fruits of Ottoman river transportation than elsewhere is because Baghdad was also accessible by both the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. So as you see on the map, the, Tig the Baghdad is located on the Tigris. But also, if you notice, Baghdad happens to be the area where the Tigris and Euphrates are closest to each other. And this is not the case elsewhere. So elsewhere, if you're in Hassan Cave, for example, Hassan Cave was only accessible by the Tigris. The Euphrates was just simply too far away to be accessible by both rivers. This was not the case in Baghdad. So whether you were traveling by, over the, along the Tigris or the Euphrates, Baghdad was an accessible city. Okay? So to put it differently, Baghdad emerged as the biggest beneficiary of Ottoman river transportation because in the Tigris-Euphrates basin, all roads led to Baghdad. And because of the geographic centrality of Baghdad within the river basin, most of the guns and grains um, and timber that the Ottoman government poured into the Tigris and Euphrates out of all other places, they ended up in Baghdad because this was the most accessible city to them. And this is where the, uh, the, those resources, guns, grains, and, uh, uh, and, and arms were, in most, were in, uh, mostly in need. And from here, Baghdad would pump out all those resources to the rest of the southern part of the eastern frontier. Okay. And the regular inflow of those resources eventually transformed Baghdad into um, the most ominous display of Ottoman military might in the East. So let me explain very briefly three facets of the Ottoman militarization of Baghdad through river transportation. All right? So, so number one, the Tigris and Euphrates allowed the Ottoman state to militarize and fortify Baghdad with arms, uh, uh, with arms. and Baghdad ended up having more art artillery pieces than any other eastern city uh, within the Ottoman Empire. So uh, there are many uh, counts that we have from different time periods, but I just prepared one count that dates from the time this map was prepared in the middle of the 17th century. So according to one estimate from 1652, the Ottoman arms cache in Baghdad included 1,060 artillery pieces. And this was a highly unusual number by the standards of the time. It was very difficult for a faraway government based in Istanbul to maintain this sizable and impressive uh, cache of arms in a, in a distant city like Baghdad. And Baghdad ended up with more arms than it ever wanted to have. And that was possible because they were so easy to transport and deliver those bulk uh, arms to transport to the city of Baghdad than elsewhere. Another facet of how river transportation really militarized and, for, and, and fortified Baghdad in unusual ways was the Tigris and Euphrates allowed the Ottoman state to station more professional soldiers in Baghdad than any other city on the eastern frontier. And most of those professional soldiers belonged to the Janissary Corps and an artillery corps. And together, the Janissary and artillery corps that the Ottoman state stationed in Baghdad ranged between 1,000 and 10,000 men, depending on the rhythm of military activity. And part of 
a large portion of my time uh, researching the book was to reconstruct um, a more extended version of this table, just to chart the changes and the manpower that the Ottoman state was able to station in the region over time and how those numbers changed. Third and lastly, the Tigris and Euphrates allowed the Ottoman state to militarize and fortify Baghdad with military industrial facilities, including a gunpowder mill and a cannon foundry that supported Ottoman war, war efforts in both the eastern and western war front. So you see here, I tried also to reconstruct the output of the, uh, uh, of the gun, gunpowder mill and the cannon foundry of the Ottoman state in Baghdad, how much it produced and how important it was for the Ottoman state to support its military efforts in the west and the east. So to summarize those ways that river, transformation, uh, river transportation really transformed Baghdad as a city, I just gave a case study of how Baghdad emerged from the 16th century as a military juggernaut with a large reserve of artillery, thousands of soldiers, and military industrial complex. And Istanbul could not maintain this heavy military presence in a distant province like Baghdad had it not been for waterborne transportation along unified river channels, which allowed Istanbul to systematically keep Baghdad well supplied with heavy artillery, grain, and personnel until the 18th century. All right, so really river transportation changed one major city in the region in this scary ways. And this is why in the Ottoman period, we mostly know in popular culture, Baghdad as the city of peace, the city of peace, right? The abode of peace, Darus Salam. But guess what? In Ottoman documents, they become to be referred to more often as the abode of jihad. It was Darul Jihad. And this transformation of Baghdad city from the abode of peace in medieval times to the abode of jihad in early modern times was only possible because the Ottoman, system, uh, the Ottoman state was obsessed with militarizing the city. And it could do so thanks to the opportunities that the Tigris and Euphrates provided for transportation and made all the transportation of those resources, especially heavy arms and artillery, much easier than would, ha would it have been if the Ottoman state had to deal with overland transportation. Okay, so this is the fourth item of my agenda. So to summarize so far, I explained the geography of my story, the timeline, the argument, and I just provided a case study to flesh out the details of my argument. Now I want to move to the fifth item of my agenda, which is to test my argument. Right? I was expecting pushback in Q&A, and people will say, well, I don't buy your argument. So I try to uh, anticipate. And I will show why, uh, really, river transportation made a difference. So to do this uh, ex historical experiment, right, to test my argument and to prove why I am right, and I always tell my students I am always right, um, is that uh, let's compare the Ottoman experience in Baghdad with the Ottoman experience in Tabriz, all right? So why I chose Tabriz as a comparative case study? Well, because uh, both Baghdad and Tabriz are located roughly within the same distance from Istanbul, the center of the Ottoman government, right? So Baghdad, if you notice, is about 1,600 kilometers away from Istanbul. And Tabriz was roughly the same distance, about 1,500 kilometers from Istanbul. In fact, Tabriz was slightly closer to the Ottoman center of government by roughly 100 kilometers. Now, even though both Tabriz and Baghdad are within the same distance from Istanbul, the Ottoman imperial project fared very differently in both cities. So in Baghdad, the Ottoman imperial project succeeded by keeping Iraq under Ottoman control all the way to World War I. So by any measure, it was not a perfect imperial experience, but comparatively speaking, the Ottoman imperial project in the larger scheme of things was successful in this part of the world. On the other hand, in Tabriz, the Ottoman imperial project failed miserably. <laughs> 
and by a quick count, I was able to identify five Ottoman occupations of Tabriz, and all of those occupations ended in failure within a few years, leading to the abandonment of the city by Ottoman troops. So let me take you very quickly about those attempts by the Ottoman state to capture Tabriz and how they ended. So Selim I, after the Battle of Chaljuan, 1514, conquered Tabriz. A few years later, Tabriz returned to Safavid hands. After Selim I, Suleiman I came in and he captured Tabriz in the, in the year 1534. And guess what? A few decades later, Tabriz returned to Safavid hands. 1610, Sultan Mehmed I tried to capture Tabriz, but the Ottoman army suffered from poor provisions and retreated. 1618, there was a brief Ottoman occupation of Tabriz. 1634, 1635, Murad IV, in person, led an Ottoman army to Tabriz to finally capture the city. He could plunder Tabriz, but he could not rule it. In short, even though Tabriz was closer to Istanbul than Baghdad, the Ottomans could never rule Tabriz for any considerable stretch of time. Despite many attempts and a desire uh, to control this strategic city along the Safavid, Eastern, uh, the Safavid borderland, on the other hand, Baghdad, even though it was further away from Tabriz, the Ottomans established a largely stable administration in the city until World War I. Now the question is, how do we explain the stark difference between the Ottoman experience in Tabriz and the Ottoman experience in Baghdad? So why, how is it possible that even though Tabriz was closer, it was never incorporated into the Ottoman Empire, while Baghdad was a bit further away, it was roughly successfully integrated uh, under the arms of the Ottoman state. Well, I argue that a major factor that contributed to the success of the Ottoman imperial enterprise in Baghdad and to its failure in Tabriz, even though both of them were roughly the same distance from Istanbul, is that Baghdad could easily be integrated within the Ottoman imperial orbit through river transportation along the Tigris and Euphrates, while Tabriz lacked any navigable rivers that could smooth the process of its integration within the Ottoman Empire. For me, this is really a major difference between the two experiences. And uh, of course, the Tigris and Euphrates do not define everything and determine everything, but it was a critical difference. One city enjoyed a natural system of waterborne communication that allowed Baghdad to be better integrated into the Ottoman imperial orbit. The other city did not lack all this natural transportation system. And this really frustrated Ottoman transportation uh, to provision its army and made the Ottoman imperial experience here an absolute disaster. Okay. I have very f a few minutes and I will conclude with the last item of my agenda, which is historiography. So all of us engaged in historical research or any kind of research in any discipline were our research does not exist in a vacuum, right? We write, and by writing, we engage in a conversation with those who have written about our topic for generations before us, and for those who continue to think about the questions we ask ourselves, right? Now, the major conversation I entered by doing this research is to converse with historians who have been thinking about the Tigris and Euphrates. And what I found when I was doing my research is that most of the discussion that historians have been having about the Tigris and Euphrates is um, focused mostly on a narrow time period between the Sumerian civilization in the fourth millennium down to the Mongol period. And I always was surprised and frustrated. Why does not this conversation continue beyond the Ottoman, beyond the Mongol period? Why don't we hear much about what the Tigris and Euphrates did, if any, after the Mongols during the Ottoman period, and including the Mandate and the modern periods? And I think I, have a, I think I have a theory for why this conversation does not go beyond the Mongols. And that is because there, according to conventional narrative, the Mongols destroyed the irrigation system of the city. And by doing so, they 
really rendered the Tigris and Euphrates largely irrelevant to the economy and to the politics of the region. Now, whoever ruled this, the region could not benefit from, because the Tigris and Euphrates were in many ways a cash cow. Mesopotamia was a cash cow for all the major states of the region until the Abbasids and definitely did not continue beyond the Mongols. But that was no longer the case. And as a result, the Tigris and Euphrates ended up being marginalized after uh, the Mongol period. My, my attempt in this research is to, uh, like my intervention, is just to make the case why we really should pay attention to the Tigris and Euphrates beyond the Mongol period. And this is why. There are two reasons. One reason is that irrigation agriculture was never the sole function of the Tigris and Euphrates. And it's never the sole function of any river system. Rivers are utilized for so many other countless purposes. So if irrigation agriculture and the irrigation civilization of the Tigris and Euphrates declined, and it did decline, the Tigris and Euphrates could be utilized for other purposes. And I just explained the major role of the Tigris and Euphrates in society after the Mongols, and that was transportation as forms, as a natural system of transportation that really helped the Ottoman state to remake the geopolitics of the region. And another reason why we need to pay attention to the Tigris and Euphrates beyond the Mongol period is because we have enough evidence from Ottoman archival records of farmers making a, a drastic shift in how they approached the Tigris and Euphrates after the Mongols. Before the Mongols, the Tigris and Euphrates, farmers of the region, had an exclusive focus on the rivers to use it for irrigation agriculture. But what we see after the Mongols, well into the Ottoman period, is a process of economic diversification. So farmers no longer have this uh, uh, one-dimensional vision of the Tigris and Euphrates. They try to use the Tigris and Euphrates partly for irrigation agriculture, but also they diversified and try to pursue other food production activities that could be made possible by uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. And the major one was livestock herding. The Tigris and Euphrates, through their annual flood cycle, generated extensive grasslands and woodlands that could uh, sustain large, impressively large herds. And I was able to do the math from the second half of the 18th, 16th century and to count the sheep. And this is what I did. I, spent my, yeah, I counted the sheep and I counted the cattle and the water buffalo, and this is impressive. So now you see something unusual, and that farmers uh, no longer only focus exclusively on irrigation agriculture, but now every household, farming household, does some crop cultivation, but on the other hand, also, they maintain a sizable herd to sustain their uh, agricultural existence. So to summarize, my contribution is instead of describing the post-Mongol period as a period of environmental decline in the Tigris-Euphrates basin, I argue that it is more appropriate to call it a period of economic diversification in which the local population shifted from um, an emphasis on irrigation agriculture to an economy based on mixed farming that relied equally on crop cultivation and livestock grazing. Thank you very much. Thank you.